Thank you, Jason and the team. Good morning, everyone. Tell you what, the kids leave and church empties out. I kind of feel like maybe we should just join them in the back and go and dance around there some more a little bit. That can be fun. Um, I know some of you are probably wondering, you know, normally after Summer Kids Club, in the Sunday afterwards, we, we kind of have a big thank you for Lisa and just acknowledge some of the volunteers. That will come. We haven't forgotten. We know that the likes of Lisa and Hannah, as well as many others, did a lot of hard work over the last couple of weeks for Summer Kids Club and for all the activity that took place. Uh, so when you see them, thank them, encourage them, um, pray for them, you know, throw coffee and candy at them to help them. Uh, as we say, thank you. Uh, but we will acknowledge them in a couple of weeks' time, so, so don't worry about that. While I'm talking about a couple of weeks' time, uh, and seeing as the children are no longer in here, yes, summer is slowly coming to an end. It, it, I'm sad to break that news to you that in a month's time, we will be in the fall. Coffee shops are already beginning to advertise their pumpkin spice lattes. And, and I feel that that is terrible. Um, not the pumpkin spice latte, it's that summer is coming to an end. Uh, and so in the fall, when we have our fall kickoff starting in the middle of September, I am so looking forward to our sermon series coming up. We are tackling the topic of the Holy Spirit. And so for a number of weeks, for, for probably about 10 weeks or so, we're going to be journeying through who is the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do, how does the Holy Spirit move through us and, and thereby touch the world. And so that's going to be a fantastic series. And you will get way more out of that series if you are in a life group. We're encouraging a whole number of our life groups to spend time discussing some of the topics, discussing the themes that come up. Uh, and so if you're not in a small group, if you're not in a life group where you're able to do that, I would encourage you, chat to Pastor Jennifer uh, and, and get some details so that you can join one of those groups. It's going to be heaps of fun. This morning, let's continue on our journey. Uh, you know, this past week, I was with a, a few friends at a restaurant uh, and we were just kind of hanging out, enjoying each other's company. And while we were there, a song came on over the radio, over the system, uh, in the restaurant. And it was Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero. Uh, now, I know for some of you, that immediately makes you think of Footloose, the movie that came out in the late 80s. Uh, I think it was about the late 80s. But, you know, we ended up discussing this song, Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero, because it just doesn't seem very politically correct Nowadays, now I know some of you might be going, well, we don't, I don't know the song, you know, what, what's, what's the deal here? So, Holding Out for a Hero begins with the words, where have all the good men gone and where are all the gods? Where's the streetwise Hercules to fight the rising odds? The chorus, and I, I, I will hold back from breaking out into song, uh, but the chorus is, I need a hero. I'm holding out for a hero till the end of the night. He's got to be strong, and he's got to be fast, and he's got to be fresh from the fight. And of course, my personal favorite line in the song is, it's going to take a Superman to sweep me off my feet. Now, you can understand why we discuss the PC nature of that song. Uh, I, I'm not sure a song like that would really hit the top hits right now. Now, for the record, I do not believe that women should be sitting around waiting for a hero to swoop in and save the day. Uh, I, I believe that both men and women can, in fact, be heroes. Women aren't helpless in this regard, not at all. In fact, I would go so far as to say the world around us desperately needs both men and women to be heroes to step up and to step into the fight, as it were, to bring mercy, to bring justice, uh, to bring freedom, to bring release. You know, maybe, maybe that's why hero movies resonate with us. You know, we, we are encaptured by this hero story, whether it's a movie, a TV series, a book, whatever the case might be. We're, we're captured by this idea of a, a good person, male or female, seeing something that's just terrible and tragic and devastating and rising to that challenge and stepping in to help. And we have that inner desire. We have this need to step in or to see someone step in. 
You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been journeying through a series called Small Part, Big Story. And I believe for many of us, the small part that we play is still to be that hero in that small way. You know, the big story that's taking place around us throughout history is the big story of God at work. God redeeming humanity, God taking on flesh, becoming man so as to rescue, to forgive, and to save, and and dying for our sins, but not as Jason prayed, not staying dead, rising back to life to show that he has the power to give eternal life. And this is the big story that God is telling throughout history. And for many of us, we try and make the big story all about us. And it's a dull, boring, waste of time story. In fact, we're invited by God to acknowledge and to see that we have a small part to play. And that small part is still significant in the big story. And so today, as I look at a small part, we're going to look at a really interesting passage and a really interesting character, a guy by the name of Phinehas. Uh, And Phinehas you'll find in Numbers 25. We're going to read from that in just a few moments If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Numbers 25. Uh, I know that the screen had a few technical glitches. You might not see all the words over there. Uh, And my theme this morning, if you're taking notes, is I'm I'm just going to plagiarize Bonnie Tyler right there. My theme is holding out for a hero. Holding out for a hero. but, But my question to you is, will you be that hero? Will you be the hero? The dictionary defines a hero as a person of distinguished courage, whether that's moral courage or physical courage, someone of distinguished courage who steps up and who steps in, who isn't afraid to get hands dirty and to to get involved in a situation. You know, when I say hero, I, I mentioned Superman a moment ago, and maybe you're thinking of those cartoon heroes. Maybe you're thinking of Batman or Spider-Man or Iron Man or any one of, of the, the superheroes out there. Maybe you're, you're a little more romantic and your hero is someone like Inigo Montoya uh, from The Princess Bride. I love that guy. I, I might mention him later on. Uh, maybe you're a little more classic and your hero is Aragorn from, uh, from Lord of the Rings. Uh, of course, if I talk about hero and your hero is a Mills and Boone character, we need to talk after the service. Now, now maybe you, you, when you think of hero, you don't necessarily think of a fictional you know, maybe you don't spend a lot of time in that. And so for you, maybe a hero is a sport hero. I'm always amazed when I look at the sporting world and you see these giants on the sports field or, or on the ice. Uh, these giants who not only do incredible things in their sporting field, but also off the field. And they get involved in philanthropic work and they, they serve and they help and they, they donate and they do so much. And so we acknowledge them as heroes and sometimes we even immortalize them as heroes. We put up their jerseys and their numbers, and we we recognize them. You know, the Bible is full of heroes, full of characters who played their part, their small part in God's big story, and they are remembered for that. Now, i got to tell you, just before we read, Numbers 25 is one of those passages that I don't understand how this got in the Bible. Because you're going to see in a moment. Now, I'm not going to defend the Bible in that regard. I believe we can read a story like this, and once we get over some of the graphic nature and and almost the shock of it, I think we can mine it for depth. And we can find that God still speaks to us even through something as, as seemingly absurd or as crazy as this. So strap on your seatbelts. Let's read. Numbers 25, this is Phinehas. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor, And the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. 
So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. I'm going to stop there for a moment. You know, when I look at, at Phinehas, and he hasn't come onto the scene yet, he, he will in a moment, but when I look at Phinehas as this hero within the story, I see three things. Uh, it, they're almost like three points that I think we can learn from as we unpack this a little while down the line. But the first thing I notice is that Phinehas witnesses the sin. He witnesses the sin that is taking place in the nation of Israel. And I think that's what likens him to any superhero. You know, when I talk about superheroes, generally superheroes arise because something is going wrong. And it necessitates a need for a hero. You know, for Superman, it was the evil ways of Lex Luthor. For Spider-Man, it was the crime that permeated his city. Uh, for Batman, it was the avenging and terrible crime wave throughout Gotham. And that was responsible for the death of his parents. And, and so these superheroes rise up because they experience and they witness what's taking place around them. And, and that's the same with Phinehas this morning. Israel remains encamped around Shittim for a considerable time. This is where they departed in order to, promise in, to cross in to the promised land. And it's during this stay, they were, you know, they're kind of hanging out there, and, and they're not just alone, isolated. There are people groups around them. They're these little tribes in the area. They're not alone. There are others. And we read that there are these Moabite people who worship false gods. And slowly but surely, the, the men are led off into this. And they begin to commit sexual immorality or, or fornication, depending on what scripture you're reading. And this is kind of their final failure before the conquest of Canaan. The Bible doesn't tell us how they ended up committing sexual immorality or what led them to that. We do know from history and we do know from biblical accounts that within those days, temple prostitution was, was a big thing. And so it's very possible that these men decided that they were just there for the sexual gratification and the pleasure. They, they weren't necessarily worshiping, but of course, they slowly got dragged into this. And they're slowly dragged into beginning to practice as the peoples around them. They're invited to, or they start finding themselves in feasts, in religious festivals, in worship to false gods. And God says, or, or God looks at this, and God's wrath is stirred up. They've relaxed their standards on what God has said to them. God's already issued the law. God's told them, you will have no other gods beside me. All the other commandments hinge on that first commandment. And yet the Israelites encamped where they are in the wilderness, that's the one they break. They go and they worship and they yoke themselves. It, it's this implication that it's not just a light-hearted little dabbling. It's not that they just stroll in, kind of get a fix, and then off they go. No, they're yoked. They're immersed in it. They're, they're now practicing it. They've taken these gods back to their homes. They've taken these women back to their homes. They're worshiping false gods. And God says, you have violated my command. And so God orders Moses to put to death the heads and the chiefs. In fact, he says, expose them before the Lord. Basically, what that means in literal terms is they would kill those chiefs, probably by stoning. And then they would leave their bodies out in the sun to expose them. And this was supposed to be a graphic reminder for the consequence of sin. Can you see why I say this is quite a challenging chapter? It, what do I do with this when God commands this? But in fact, it's not just the rulers, those who've evidently been lax and they haven't kept their responsibility of leading. Because Moses then says, basically kill everyone who has yoked themselves to Baal. And don't just kill the leaders, kill everyone who's involved in worship. And they begin to, to sense the, the seriousness of the sin. Let's pick it up from verses 6 to 9. Then an Israelite man 
brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. I shouldn't have to paint a picture of what's going on in that moment. And then the plague against Israel, the, the Israelites was stopped. But those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. Now, the, the scripture, the texture here infers that God sent a plague upon Israel because they've abandoned worshiping God. Now, God sends this plague as a judgment over their sexual immorality and their idolatry. And, and so representatives of the congregation, they gather together at the tent of meeting to mourn their sin, to worship God, to pray, to plead, to intercede on behalf of the Israelites. But even in the midst of this, even in the midst of the plague, even in the midst of the leaders having been executed and representatives mourning, one man, his name is Zimri, blatantly continues to violate the Lord's command. And so he brings this Midianite woman in. And Elias sees this. The son of Eleazar, the the priest. And he's mad. He's had about as much as he can take, and he decides something needs to happen. So he witnesses the sin. But then after he witnesses the sin, the second thing he does is he weighs up the situation. Again, if I stick with that hero theme, those heroes witness the sin. They they witness the problems. They experience what's going wrong. They're they're immersed. They, They witness it, and then they weigh up the situation to see what needs to happen. In fact, I mentioned Inigo Montoya earlier on. For those who don't know Princess Bride, you've really missed a great movie. I would say arguably one of the best movies in the history of movies, really. Uh, But Inigo Montoya, his parents are killed by the six-fingered man. Uh, And so Inigo spends his entire life preparing and training and becoming a swordsman and this master craftsman with his sword. And right through the movie, he kind of really just keeps saying the same thing over and over. And when asked about what he will do when he confronts the six-fingered man, he says, I will say to him, hello, my name is Diego Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And he spends his life, and and of course, I won't spoiler alert, but he witnesses the pain, and he takes his life to prepare to get involved. That's not what Phineas does. Phineas, he witnesses the sin, and he weighs the situation immediately. And instead of preparing and taking his time, he grabs a spear, and he responds. He rises up from the congregation, and he goes And of course, the the scripture is quite clear. They're in the throes of passion. It's not just that Zimri has brought this woman in. It's that he has fully immersed and aligned himself with her and with her gods. And so Phinehas stabs them both. He weighs up the situation and he takes action. Yeah, I want to focus on just a few words in this verse, just for a moment. In verse 7, where we read, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this. He left the assembly took a, and took a spear in his hand. You know, Phinehas' name in Hebrew means mouth of a serpent. And the mouth there meaning particularly speech. Now, we could have a great study just around that name, Uh, but the implication of someone like that and somebody with a name like Phinehas is they're not afraid to speak up. They're not afraid to say what needs to be said. And so Phinehas, evidently by his actions, lives up to his name. He sees the sin, and he gets up and takes action. He speaks out in a way. But, but another small word that I think we often overlook in this one is his word for, the word for hand. Uh, the Hebrew has two words for hand. One is kaf, which simply means a curved or a hollow, like the palm of your hand. 
Sometimes that word calf might be used for the, the sole of a foot. It might even be used for a bowl or, or a spoon. But the point of calf is it's a passive word. Action gets done to calf. It's not the one that does the action. It's a passive word. The other Hebrew word for hand is the word yad. Yad is the one that is used here. And yad means strength and power. It's a powerful word. And typically, yad is used when the hand of God is on someone. So, for instance, when we read in Ezra chapter 7, as the hand of Jehovah, his God, was upon him, it's the same word, yad. It's the, uh, the meaning is there's this power as God moves, as God equips and gives strength. And so Phineas, as he responds, as he sees the sin, as he weighs up the situation, and as he gets involved, it's the implication that God strengthens him and God enables him. And so our hero goes forth. So he witnesses the sin. He weighs up the situation. And lastly, he wipes out the stain. Phineas completely eradicates the stain from the camp. To eradicate means to destroy or get rid of something completely. Let me, for, for the last time in the sermon, let me talk about some superheroes. One of the things that drives me crazy about Batman... Whenever Batman catches one of the villains, doesn't matter which villain it is, he never kills the villain. He always takes the villain to Arkham Asylum. And that's where all the baddies get thrown. And Batman's like, there we go, job done. They're in prison. And they always escape. I feel like he could have saved a lot of pain if he had just played the role of executioner as well. But he doesn't. That's not what Phineas does here. Phineas doesn't make that same mistake. He doesn't bring out Zimri and say, okay, let's try him and let's put him in a jail. Now, Phineas wipes out the stain. He removes the sin. He takes his spear and he kills them both. And this isn't just in, in like a petty fleshly anger. He is enraged with this almost divine anger to purge the camp of its sin. In fact, we read later on in Numbers 25 and verse 13 that he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. The terms zealous and jealous, by the way, are identical in Hebrew. They refer to the manner in which Phinehas acts to vindicate the holiness of God. He is both zealous for the holiness of God and he is jealous for the holiness of God. Hey, he refuses to sit by idly while God's holiness is defiled in the camp. And so because of this, because of what he's doing, he becomes, or sorry, his descendants would become the high priests of the people of Israel. In fact, we read later on that the Lord makes a covenant of perpetual priesthood. You know, Phineas, his actions halt the plague. So far, that plague's taken 24,000 lives that's more than what was lost during the plague that came about from the worship of the golden calf during Moses' time on, mountain, on the mountain when they received the Ten Commandments, which kind of just reminds you how Israel just keeps doing this, and they refuse to learn from their own history. But Phineas responds. He witnesses the sin, he weighs up the situation, and he wipes out the stain. And God blesses him for it. Now, I could say amen there, and let's leave it. But what do we do with a passage like that today? Because the sad reality and the truth of this kind of passage is that all too often it's used as a justification and as an excuse to simply go out and commit more sin. It's like we've forgotten that we live with both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so people will use this passage of Scripture to say there is sin all around us. So go and execute that sin. And sadly, people do. And so we see people literally murdered by those who call themselves zealous for God. We see Christians who decide that they're going to blow up some building because it, it's practicing sin or it, it's enabling sin. 
And they take it upon themselves to now be judge, jury, and executioner. And they'll jump to the scripture. But I don't believe that this scripture is teaching us that in this time. Sure, it had a context. It, it, it had significance. It had a deep meaning in the nation of Israel at that time. But we have to mine this for depth and say, what does this mean for me and for you? And I think it has meaning. And I think it has application. We live in light of the entire council of Scripture, the Old and New Testament. So when I read a passage like this, there are three layers that I look at. The first is self. What is this saying to me? How do I need to respond to me, not others around? And then the second is others. What is the saying to me as I walk in relationship with other people? And then the third layer is the community, or, or maybe that corporate civic society around me. So let me think about self just briefly. You know, Jesus himself said we are to be ruthless with sin in our own lives. In, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives this amazing little wordplay and this little image of how so often we want to take the speck out of our brother or sister's eye and we ignore the plank in our own eye. And, and so Jesus elsewhere in Matthew 5 talks about being ruthless with sin in our own lives. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now Jesus is not saying maim yourself. Jesus is saying, be ruthless with sin in your own life. And so when you read the story of Phinehas, it should challenge us to say, what's going on in my own life? Where are those sins? What have I allowed into the camp of my own life? How will I be ruthless to get rid of that? That's where I start. Before you try and rush out and bomb a building, start at home. But then the second part is what about those around me? What about others? You know, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 6. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You know, when I read that in light of the whole council of Scripture, I know it's very easy for every one of us to be able to point to somebody else in the church and to say, that person is sinning. And, and, and Paul says, no. Go to them. And go to them with love and humility and grace. Don't go there with judgment and condemnation because you're just going to get conceited and proud and you know what? You're going to stumble somewhere else. So rather than trying to excommunicate someone from the congregation, rather than trying to tell somebody they've got to leave, no, journey with them. Encourage them, carry them, walk with them, and help them process that sin. By doing this in love and with love, we will truly see the world slowly becoming more filled with the presence of God. And then lastly, before I close off in a few moments, what about that community layer? What about that corporate or that civic? You know, Phinehas was filled with anger. Phinehas was filled with anger at the sin that was taking place, and he responded with uh, God's help. And I want to remind you, the Bible also says, in your anger, do not sin. So don't start being one of those kind of Christians, and I want to choose my words carefully, because this is being recorded. But, but don't, don't be one of them. Don't start taking it upon yourself in a post-Christian, non-Christian world to try and expect Christian values from society around us. We simply cannot do that. We cannot expect a world who does not worship God to now try and follow God's commands. That's not how it works. And so when we see sin, when we see the obvious uh, examples of things that should ought not to be done, and we begin in prayer, and we begin with grace, and then we speak up with love and in winsome ways. Yes, we can share Christ, and we can love, even as we warn people of the consequences of those choices. I, I, I said this ages ago in church. You're welcome to do whatever you want. 
The Bible's quite clear. We're forgiven in Christ, not by our actions. And so if you want to do whatever you want, whether it's do drugs or get drunk or become addicted to pornography, you can do that, and it's probably not going to affect your salvation. But don't do it. Amen. Amen. Because it will mess up your life. And as we see others who are walking in the consequences of their choices, let's not throw condemnation on them. Let's go and lovingly and with grace and with mercy warn them. Yes, speak up when we need to speak up. Yes, write letters when we need to write letters. Yes, get involved in social action when we need to get involved in social action. But let's always do it as we proclaim the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Phinehas played a small part in the big story of God. He witnessed the sin, he weighed up the situation, and he wiped out the stain. My prayer for you this morning is that you would begin with those three in your life. And then as you journey with those three in your life, then you would start to in community with brothers and sisters in Christ. And only then that we would begin to influence and impact our world. Let's pray together. Father, as we read Scripture, as we read the whole counsel of Scripture, we come across stories like this from the Old Testament, and and at a surface, they're gruesome, and they're almost confusing. And we wrestle with this idea that, God, you commanded the nation. But Lord, in a sense, I'm reminded you commanded the nation to take care of themselves, to deal with the sin in themselves. And Father, you haven't changed that for us as individuals. You still call us to be aware of sin and those choices in our own lives that will ultimately destroy us. You call us to be ruthless with that. And so, Father, this morning, I pray for this entire congregation, those here in person and those watching online, That by your Holy Spirit, they would be prompted to acknowledge what are those sins, what are those those things of wickedness, as it were, that they've allowed into the camp of their own lives. And as we have our eyes open to that, God, help us to repent of that. Help us to confess it to you and to confess it to others so that we can journey towards wholeness and restoration and forgiveness. And then, God, as we do that for ourselves and in our own lives, help us to do that as a community of Christ followers so that ultimately a watching world outside would see something different. They would walk in as visitors and feel there is a spirit at work here, a spirit of love and of unity. And may it lead them to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then, Father, ultimately we do pray for our society We do pray for our country. We pray for the world around us. It's so easy, Lord, to point fingers and to to get angry and upset at policies we don't like, uh, politics we don't like, politics and policies that seem so sinful and so foreign to the Word of God. Father, help us to live as light in the midst of darkness, to point back to you so that ultimately we would see our community changed as it responds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for your kingdom and glory. Amen.